Fear fills the void at all costs, passing off what you dread for what you know, offering up the worst in place of the ambiguous, substituting assumption for reason. Fear replaces the unknown with the awful. Now, fear is self-realizing. When you face the greatest need to look outside yourself and think critically, fear beats a retreat deep inside your mind, shrinking and distorting your view, drowning your capacity for critical thought with a flood of disruptive emotions. When you face a compelling opportunity to take action, fear lulls you into inaction, enticing you to passively watch its prophecies fulfill themselves. How do you live your life eyes wide open? It is a learned discipline. It can be taught. It can be practiced. I'll summarize very briefly. Hold yourself accountable for every moment, every thought, every detail. See beyond your fears. Recognize your assumptions. Harness your internal strength. Silence your internal critic. Correct your misconceptions about luck and about success. Accept your strengths and your weaknesses, and understand the difference. Open your hearts to your bountiful blessings. Your fears, your critics, your heroes, your villains—they are your excuses, rationalizations, shortcuts, justifications. Your surrender. They are fictions you perceive as reality. Choose to see through them. Choose to let them go. You are the creator of your reality. With that empowerment comes complete responsibility. I chose to step out of fear's tunnel into terrain uncharted and undefined. I chose to build there a blessed life. Those were the words of Isaac Lidsky, whom I saw recently in a speech at Magical Austin, Texas. During an event that also had me see Matthew McConaughey and Willie Nelson, yeehaw! Thought I'd share with you as we destroy our villains and heroes here. Fill the unknown not with fear, but with gnosis, that direct knowledge or acquaintance with the unknown. All right, all right, all right. Oh, Christ. Welcome to Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, broadcast at the virtual Alexandria, that state of mind where East meets West, always through the God above God Dad Cam. This is where the falling angel meets the rising ape. This is where you find your daemon or higher self, or at the very least, the best version of yourself. No longer filling those spaces with fear, but hermetic responsibility. Here in the inner sanctum of gnosis, in those outer rectums of reality. You are not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You're not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your fucking khakis. I'm so glad you've joined me on this dark odyssey through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy, all the way to the farthest shores of imagination. Like the Gospel of Philip says, the God should worship us, and like the Apocalypse of Adam says, we are higher than the gods. At least we're more creative, logical, and empathic. As seen by the state of this universe and the world, where the butt slaves of the gods, the elite, further ruin anything kind and good in all sentient life. So much fear in our social media news feeds, thanks to them. Too many heroes and villains. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. I am, and I am Abraxas, that terrible god above god as the ancients knew him. I come to you in my falling angel, rising ape incarnation of Miguel Connor, broadcasting from the lawful but frigid dystopia of Chicago, patiently waiting for the beginning of the world. I am your pompous of gnosis, your humble midwife of contraband truths and impossible secrets. Well, I wrestled with reality for 35 years, Doctor, and I'm happy to state I finally won out over it. 
Let's transform this material existence together. This cosmic existential morass that is one big fake news, Moloch machine, Pizzagate factory, and just a tasteless, boring reality. There's probably no meaning to life, but we will paint so much meaning on the canvas of a colorless cosmos and inspire so many dormant divine sparks to sparkle within sleeping human beings and even animals and falling angels and rising apes. I've quoted this before, but it's so important as it encapsulates the ethos of the show and the Philosopher's Stone for your liberation. It's from the Gnostic New Age by April DeConnick. It goes, Gnostic movements are not about civic or familial duty. They are not a contest in appeasement or a placation of a god to be feared. They are not premise on attempts to secure God's favorable judgment and recognition in order to procure a better life here or hereafter. They are about the renewal of the human as God and the wielding of this personal power to forge a better life in the here and now and forever. Gnosticism emerged from the life experience of people who were oppressed but had no hope for political advantage. They felt estranged. Literally ancient Gnostic movements and religions reoriented the focus of religion from the welfare of the gods to the health and well-being of humans who were not meant to submit to the gods of this world but to vanquish them. You are specks of dust beneath our fingernails. Your very breath is a gift from Olympus. You have insulted powers beyond your comprehension. On this February, the year of our Demiurge 2017, our astral guest also encapsulates the quote. That is my friend, collaborator, and fellow podcaster, Mo Bedard. He materializes at the virtual Alexandria to discuss sundry blasphemies, based on his popular podcast, Gnostic Warrior, and his new book, The Order of the Gnostics, Ancient Teachings for the Modern Gnostic. I've been on Mo's show before, and now the infernal tables are turned for a puissant, intriguing discussion on surviving and thriving in this West world we call civilization. For more information on Mo, please visit, you got it, Gnostic Warrior Dad Can. This is where we hold them! This is where we fight! This is where they die! As some of you may know or experience, we recently switched podcast providers, while at the same time having to trim some of our shows on iTunes and even YouTube. Aeon Byte is just getting that popular. Thus, so you can get access to all shows, 10 years worth with the best and brightest in Gnostic studies in Western Esoterica, I've made the Arch of of Past shows a mere $5.99 to join. That's it, no contract or minimum payment. But please consider this as also a way to support this red pill cafeteria that depends solely on your support. Beyond that, please support Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. A few shekels here and there, perhaps via PayPal or Patreon, where you pay only if I produce. And so if you pledge a dollar a show, it might cost you about, I don't know, four or five a month. And that's the usual amount of content I create every lunar cycle. You can also go to our Amazon wish list at the God Above God Dad Cam. Buy any of the books listed there and through there, and I get a kickback. For example, clicking the graphic or link to other voices of Gnosticism at the homepage. Even if you don't buy those books and then buy something else, taking the book out of your cart, I still get a kickback. Consider the God Above God Dat Cam as your Amazon portal. I do have an Amazon wish list as I'm always looking for new equipment to get by. 
All methods of support are found at, yes, thegodabovegod.com, or just email me if you want to know more at miguel at thegodabovegod.com. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! You are a smelly pirate hooker. Much appreciation and Sophia's breath to those of you who support this eternal soundtrack of the counterculture on a weekly basis. I can't do it without you. We're doing so many wonders, and the gods are scared, and the elite are Hershey squirting their stolen gold. Goodbye villains and heroes. Hello to the unknown. As Hemingway said, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. To end, and I know Mo will like this, here is a quote from Manly P. Hall that also nails the Gnostics in our sacred and profane quest. It goes, The Gnostics held that the essential nature of the human is divine. They look upon men and women as gods and goddesses who have forgotten who they are. It's from this predicament that the Gnostic aspires to be freed by Gnosis. In other words, we're writing our own gospel and living our own myth and filling the unknown with so much hermetic responsibility and meaning. Oh, and actually, to truly end, here is a passage from Mark Twain's very Gnostic, The Mysterious Stranger, which I highly recommend to everyone. Strange indeed that you should not have suspected that your universe and its contents were only dreams, visions, fiction. Strange because they are so frankly and hysterically insane, like all dreams. A god who could make good children as easily as bad, yet preferred to make bad ones, who could have made every one of them happy, yet never made a single happy one, who made them prize their bitter life, yet stingingly cut it short, who gave his angels eternal happiness unearned, yet required his other children to earn it, who gave his angels painless lives, yet cursed his other children with biting miseries and maladies of mind and body, who mouths justice and invented hell, mouths mercy and invented hell, mouths golden rules and forgiveness multiplied by seventy times seven and invented hell, who mouths morals to other people and has none himself, who frowns upon crimes yet commits them all, who created man without invitation, then tries to shuffle the responsibility for man's acts upon man, instead of honorably placing it where it belongs, upon himself. And finally, with altogether divine obtuseness, invites this poor abused slave to worship him. You perceive now that these things are all impossible except in a dream. You perceive that they are pure and puerile insanities, the silly creations of an imagination that is not conscious of its freaks in a word that they are a dream and you the maker of it. The dream marks are all present. You should have recognized them earlier. This is the AM Byte interview and with us we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Mo Bedard to discuss his book The Order of the Gnostics as well as his very exciting and growing and very popular podcast The Gnostic Warrior. How are you doing today Mo? I'm doing great Miguel. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, it's definitely a pleasure and overdue. Uh, again, uh we've uh, collaborated in the past. We kind of run in the same circles and uh we kind of we have the same mission. So uh, and you've been doing this for a while. 
but uh, probably people would like to know is uh, tell us a little bit about your path, uh, specifically how did you come to Gnosis? I would say it started for me about seven or eight years ago, um, more, more along the lines of eight years ago. And I was um, working on a, a website that I run uh, to help people with their mortgages called LoanSafe. And it, it started there, you know, looking into, you know, how the world really worked because I, I realized, you know, these people had mortgages. They were getting kind of screwed by the the banksters that, you know, people like to call them and they were losing their homes. And I, I started to learn how the the banking industry worked and the Federal Reserve. And it was kind of like a an awakening. I, I grew up in Southern California as a punk rocker and I always never trusted authority too much, but I kind of went away as from that, you know, line of thought until, you know, I got older. And then when I started studying, you know, the, the banking industry and the federal reserve, I would realize, Hey, what they told us is not really how the the world works. So it was kind of like a little bit of a, a matrix awakening. And then it led from there learning more about myself I remember watching Alex Jones one day and he's all, people don't even know themselves. They don't know where they come from. They don't know their ancestors. And, you know, it, I just remember him saying that and you go, you know what? He's right. I, I don't know. And I actually started looking into how to find out about my, my family's history. And one of the ways I learned how to do that pretty easily is actually by studying your last name. And if you you study your last name, especially if you're on the male side, because the the last name carries on for generations, it might change pronunci- pronunciations depending, you know, what country you're you're in or so forth. But it, it pretty much stays the same, you know, or it might have been a you might now have a compound of that last name. So I started studying my last name and, and finding these people all over the world. You know, my my family comes from Canada, Quebec. They were they were French. And then. I learned that, of course, the the French had to get there somehow, so they they actually got there from France. And I started finding, you know, Bedards and uh, Badas in in France, and I I found out they had a lot to do with the University of Paris and Catholicism um, prior to uh, King Henry VIII pretty much um, kicking them out of of England and so forth. But that's a that's another story. But anyways, I I kind of traced them back to France, and I kind of got stuck there a little bit. And then I started dissecting my name a little more and going, hey, if they were, you know, Bada here, um, maybe in a different country, they were, you know, a, a different pronunciation of the the same derivative of that name. And um, I got led to Ireland, actually. And uh, I found that I descend from the high kings of Ireland. So we went from Ireland um, actually to England and and. Britain area, and then we eventually made our way to um, Paris and France, and we actually were with the uh, Charlemagne's court. So we were always involved um, in the powers that be struggle. So I feel it made me kind of understand who I was, you know, some of my personality traits that I didn't understand. You know, I'm just like everybody else out there, but I had some different personality traits that I, I started researching these people. And I started seeing similar personality traits in them as I do in myself. And a lot of them were uh, writers as well, you know, as I'd mentioned, working with Charlemagne. And then one of my ancestors was uh, Saint Bada, um, or Saint Badi, um, who some people will, would like to call him. And he's a, a saint in the Catholic Church, and he's also the father of English history. And my name now, Bedard, is actually a corruption a Bada. So all this kind of started making sense when I, I started researching my last name and it kind of w- awoken me to their teachings. And I started reading the the teachings or the books that uh, St. Badi had written and just just a fabulous history had woken up and it, it really had woken me up. I felt I felt like I was here before. I I I know I was in Paris. I know I was you know, in these different power struggles, and I was documenting them. I always had an affinity for for history, and um, now I, I kind of realized who I was, and I felt not sort of important, more important than I did before, and it kind of gave me a little delusional thinking a little bit for a while, but in any event, it made me understand who I was, and that kind of started me down the path 
And then I eventually got my DNA um, tested and that opened up a whole new world. So that's kind of a the long story or short story of the of the long story of my path to Gnosis. Yeah, great story because uh, it's certainly a story of self-knowledge. And as I've discussed with uh, several guests, it's something that used to be so common in ancient times is uh, veneration for our ancestors, those who stood before us and how we really carry that information or at least some sort of sacred destiny. So I think that's the path that you've also taken. But how do you feel? Do you feel that this is, is there a fine line between this is my, these are my ancestors as sort of a, a karmic force that I can do a force of good, but there's also the problem, am I, do I have free will? Am I stuck in the same cycle of uh, my ancestors? Uh, what do you think, Mo? That's a question I've asked myself a lot, and it's a great question, and it's something I feel I, I struggle with at times. And I, I sometimes feel like I was given the baton by them to bring this history back of my family. So I, I believe that over the course of time, over the last you know, 2,000, 3,000 years, what before we used to honor our ancestors and we used to document their histories, and I think that has been lost over time with the advent of the Abraham, Abrahamic religions and the 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 power struggle between the different empires. You know, you had Rome struggling with Greco, the Greco-Egyptian empire. And, and I feel that this power struggle, they had sought to wipe out the various tribes that were a threat to their power. And I feel a lot of us were in those tribes. And if we, we go back over history, all these tribes were essentially related, meaning they were of one blood at that time. And I feel mainly when the Roman Empire came, especially, they sought to kind of put everybody together. I feel they couldn't conquer everybody, so they decided, hey, let's just put everybody together. And I feel that is what gave us the, the Catholic religion. If we look at the Catholic religion, the word is Latin for universal. And the religion prior to that, or all the religions, I believe, were, were all racial so I believe that the Catholic religion was the first one where they honored people of different blood, of different DNA, we could say, that had did work and put in work, whether it's for the church or for the Roman Empire as an emperor. And we, we see their stories and their persons honored by being saints and by being sanctified by the church, you know, so they, they become legal saints for the work they had done. They perform some miracle. So they're honored by the churches. So I believe all the religions prior to the Catholicism were all based on, on race. And then the Catholic religion was the first one. So over time, I feel they, you know, they destroyed various tribes and, and histories and books were part of that, that destruction. People that would not agree to submit to Caesar which I feel that's what happened actually with the Gnostics at that time and in Greece and Egypt were, you know, those were the holdouts saying, hey, we're not going to worship Caesar. You know, he's not our empire. This is not our story, you know. And so I believe that's when they sought to just basically destroy them through first with propaganda, Irenaeus with the, the books and, you know, the, the writings right. against the Gnostics. So I believe that's kind of where it stopped. But we all worship you know, our ancestors, and they still do to an extent. And I believe, you know, the royal class as well, they, they worship their ancestors. So we could see that, you know, you have the Greek um, Orthodox religion, the Byzantine Empire, that was kind of their ancestry. Those were their roots. And then you had the other side of the, the double-headed phoenix or eagle would be the, the Roman, the Latin Empire, which would honor and venerate some of their ancestors and then also people that put in work for them. And then you see Russia, they have a completely different system and a different saints and a different doctrine. So we could see kind of still the same thing going on in different empires today where they're still venerating their ancestors and then also people that had put in work for that empire or for that church. And for the listener that might not know, your podcast is The Gnostic Warrior. And people might say, well, why is, he saying, why is he saying the name warrior? The Gnostics were maybe ecstatic shamans. They were philosophers. They weren't, uh, except for some Cathars, they weren't really, they were pacifists for the most part. 
What in what context do you use the word warrior, Mo? Mainly, I would say along the lines is that there's been a war for your your soul for thousands of years, and I believe that sometimes people give up that power, whether it be to an outside authority or or to a religion. You know, I'm along the belief that you could be a member of the the Catholic religion or the Greek Orthodox and still be a Gnostic and my belief is that people give this away to other powers, whether it be materialism and, you know, that shiny car in the house and they're always pursuing these things that are plastic outside of them. Or it's it's a religion that is fine, but they're not pursuing their own gnosis. And so I, I believe there's somewhat of a war for your soul and people that, excuse me, that aren't connected with their soul and their spirit are much more easier to control. Um, I also believe that the Gnostics, they were pacifists, but they also could be warriors as well. And that there's a, a fine mix there. I believe that they were, they were men. You know, if you look at Plato and, and the Greeks and different people back then, they also trained. Some of them were boxers. Some of them were, were wrestlers. So I, I believe that they had sought to balance themselves and, physical activity and, and being a warrior, whether that's fighting for your empire or just, you know, keeping in shape is, is part of that process. So I believe they were pacifists for the most part, but they can get down as well, whether that be with, you know, their their hands or their fist or if it is in war as well. I think they had to um, back then. So that's kind of my, my thing there. There's a war for your soul. And um, if you have the gnosis and you study this Gnosticism and the teachings of your ancestors, you can gain back that that soul, that spirit, and you won the war. And I know you uh, practice martial arts, and of course, uh, a mutual guest of ours, Craig Williams, uh, he's very much into the martial arts and all that stuff to uh, help with his spirituality. How do you see these things help with your spirituality? I just uh, got my black belt about two years ago. And, you know, so I started training. I'm 45 now. So I started training in my my 40s. Um, I've always been interested in, in sports, but martial arts definitely it, it gave me an, an ego check, you know, going into the, the dojo and learning Hapkido and getting my black belt over a three year period. It really taught me humility, you know, going in there thinking I'm, you know, this this kind of a bad I grew up in Southern California. i been in several fights when I was younger, so I was a little bit aggressive. And as I got older, of course, I, I mellowed out. Um, but I always thought like I was pretty tough. And then it actually humbled me to go in there and get my my butt served to me by several people that <laughs> I thought <laughs> I could, you know, easily take them. And they they really taught me. And it was this skill. And it just really it, it's it's a mental, psychological, and also a, a physical thing. And you've got to blend the two. You got to learn how to control your emotions, your temperaments, and so forth. And I, I believe that's part of Gnosticism as well. Is it's of course seeking Gnosis, you know, that spiritual knowledge or this these ancient teachings of your ancestors or just the Gnostics in general. But it's also controlling yourself and controlling your appetite. So I believe, you know, some of the stories that we we read, which I believe, such as the, you know, in the Bible are actually kind of Gnostic stories of Jesus, you know, and, and taking the higher road, you know, turning the other cheek and so forth. I'm more along the lines, you you slap me in the cheek, I'm going to, you know, right hook you and get you in a rear naked chokehold. But <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I believe that, you know, it helped me kind of control my temperaments, humble myself and, and my ego. So uh, if you have issues with that, it definitely, it, it helps a lot and it actually has mellowed me. And then I know I can handle myself, you know, if, if someone, you know, doesn't have a gun or anything and they're, they're trying to assault me or, or my family, I could easily defend myself. So it gives you self-confidence as well, which I feel is important on the path. So that's kind of the, the main reason I got into martial arts and then getting my black belt and going through the whole process. I believe only 10 percent of the people that join martial arts actually go on to get their black belt. So it was nice to kind of finish that and know that I could do it. Um, but it was painful, it was hard, but it was well worth it. Yeah, congratulations. My 25-year-old son, he also just got his black belt. Um, so it was. Uh, I know he worked really hard for it, and I know it's definitely helped his life. So 
But awesome. Mo, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Congrats, You're very congratulations welcome. to your son. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud of him. So, Mo, let's talk about more than anybody, and you can find some of this research in your book, The Order of the Gnostics, Ancient Teachings for the Modern Gnostic, is the idea of DNA. I don't know anybody who's done as much research as you have, and I've read your work, unfortunately, as we've discussed, when it comes to science, I just go cross-eyed. I go, blah, 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 you know, give me philosophy or something like that every day. So tell us a little bit about your research on DNA and how it can help somebody with their own, again, finding who they are and their purpose in this modern day. I think it comes back to my wanting to know, my my desire to know things. You know, if you, you look at the word gnosis, it, it essentially is knowledge of spiritual mysteries um, from the Greek word gnostikos, um, cognitive or intellectual. It's just kind of trying to figure out exactly what is this process of gnosis? What are people feeling? You know, Plato had said, all learning is remembering. And you start seeing this common thread from philosophers talking about blood and the spirit and and gnosis and knowledge and the soul is in the heart. And, you know, I, I see all these teachings and I, I'm like, what do they really mean by this? You know, so what I wanted to do with my book and then for myself mainly was like put science to some of these teachings, which, you know, I'm attempting to do with, with a book or I hope I have done is to find out where does this gnosis come from? What does Plato mean when he says all learning is remembering? So it, you know, when I see these, you know, teachings on blood and, uh, I, it started bringing me to DNA. I was like, you know, DNA is what we're made of. It's, it's what, you know, every living creature is made of. They have a specific DNA and we're all different and could possibly this be the missing code between all of us, but also the linking code that links us all. But if we all have different DNA, we all have different gnosis. So that led me to studying DNA and and gnosis. And I started coming uh, to all this research on you know, DNA being like a computer. So I want to say a couple of quotes here. Here's um, Spencer Wells. Spencer Wells is a DNA geneticist. He was in charge of the Genome Project, and that was when they went around the world, I believe, for like three three to five years. Uh, Spencer Wells and a team, and they were testing, you know, various people all around the world, tribes and so forth. And, you know, that started the Genome Project, and that's kind of how we know about all these DNA haplogroup maps and so forth and how kind of humanity has migrated over time from Africa to various parts of of the world. And he had said, your blood contains DNA, which is like a history book. And then that led me to Carl Jung, who had said, who has fully realized the history is not contained in thick books, but lives in our very blood. Wow. And then, yeah, and then we, we have Bill Gates, who... It, we could say is one of the richest men in the world and one of the smartest men had said in the road ahead, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. So what we're we're seeing with this research and, of course, these quotes by some very smart men in our modern time is that our DNA is really what is the program for us, each individual. And your DNA has a lot to do with who you are today, your personality traits, um, the way you look. I mean, it all has to deal with DNA. So that led me into studying it more and finding out, as I'd mentioned, that your DNA acts like a computer and it's far more advanced. They're actually making software now out of salmon DNA. And it's, I think, 100 times faster than the the normal computer that they're making now with the Intel chips and, and so forth. So that's kind of what connected me to DNA. And sometimes people, you know, I'll talk about blood and DNA and they'll like think I'm trying to be racist. And it's not about that. It's about studying your DNA and it leads you to understanding who you are and finding out exactly where your ancestors come from. And then you start seeing people that have the same DNA all around the world and you'll see the same traits literally similar traits for a lot of these people that you have in yourself. So that's kind of where I believe that, you know, Plato had said all learning is remembering. And I believe that 
that is part of being a Gnostic and the Gnostic awakening today is, is remembering these teachings from your ancestors, who you were possibly in a past life. And when I study all these teachings that I'm learning of my ancestors and relatives that have similar DNA, it opened up a whole new door for me. And I believe that this science and this gnosis, it all comes together. And, and that's kind of what we're to do today is we're, of course, to study and honor the ancient teachings, but hopefully evolve them, write about them, write what they had said, but take it to the next level. And that's what I'm hoping to do with, you know, the science and DNA gnosis, et cetera. So, yeah, it's a great plan. Again, you're you're doing the research that sort of uh, nobody else is doing. And I think uh, between the science and the esoterica, you're finding some uh, very fascinating insights. I mean, for example, a lot of people have always given Augustine a lot of hell for, uh, <laughs> I don't know about literal hell, about his idea of um, original sin. But Augustine said original sin is passed down through the blood. And in a way, it makes sense. He didn't have the, the data or the science we have today, but our um, character defects, our mental diseases, our diseases, and a whole bunch of other stuff is passed down through our genes. So in a way, he was right. We are sort of trapped by the issues of our ancestors, and we need to recognize this to solve it. Correct. And, and I believe that what he had said is, is spot on, you know, and, and that's what I had noticed when I had studied my ancestors and these people I was related to and seeing similar different traits, you know, my my fiery attitude, my my temper, you know, that that was something that always had haunted me and caused problems in my life. And I knew that I s kept seeing the same trait with various ancestors. And I knew that that was one of my my goals on my bucket list is I got to, you know, control my temperament because it, it really was destroying, you know, relationships with people that I cared about, you know, friends and, and relatives and, and family members. So I believe that it's key. A lot of our uh, genetic traits, as I had mentioned, is, is passed down through your DNA. So if this genetic traits are being passed down, I also believe that knowledge is passed down through your DNA. That's why some people excel at certain things. And I believe that this mainly happens when you follow your heart. Like you do this, Miguel, you're, you're into, you know, Gnosticism, the teachings you're doing, the podcast, you've been working for many more years in this than I have. And you do it for really no money. I know you make hardly anything. You've got a real job, but you're, this is where your heart's at. If you didn't have to work in marketing and, you know, have that normal nine to five job and you could actually make a living to support your family, doing your radio show and writing, I bet that's what you would do because that's where your your heart is. So you're following the Gnostic path. You know, it doesn't always lead to to money and riches, but it's what makes us happy. And I believe, you know, for musical geniuses, you know, uh, sports geniuses, those are people that were probably that in a previous life. And they're just kind of carrying that baton in this new life. They're following their heart they're following what they want to do and they make a go out of it. And some, you know, make a lot of money or they're, they're really famous at doing that. And some of us are just like to be writers and talk about knowledge and philosophy, you know, a word that means just the love of wisdom, you know. So I believe when you follow your heart, you you follow your gnosis, you follow your path. And if you're you're honorable to that, you're honorable to your ancestors, to yourself, and you could sleep at night and, and be happy even if you don't have a whole lot of money. Agreed. And like I always like to say, it's not gnosis unless you give it away. So what we do in a way gives us insights into the world and uh, brings us, as you said, wisdom. But uh, obviously, it's not an easy path and it's not meant to be an easy path. And Mo, you've been talking about um, DNA and ancestors, but you also write in your book about reincarnation. How do you, what you might say... Um, uh, mix the two together or find a way where DNA and reincarnation or what what are your views on reincarnation? My views on reincarnation are that we do reincarnate and I believe that it happens along the same bloodline. I'm not exactly sure 100% of course how that happens but I do believe that is what happens and then I found a correlation in my studies when studying reincarnation and and Remember that many ancient cultures had believed in reincarnation. 
the Greeks, um, we could say, you know, the Jews. I believe that, you know, the various Gnostic sects at that time right. had believed in reincarnation. The Druids had believed in reincarnation. The Druzies, who we could say are a Gnostic sect, sect believe in reincarnation. And what I found is a, a common theme of, again, the blood and the soul, but also various marks. And this led me to, to birthmarks, which I found are actually race marks. So people that are of a similar race will have similar marks, which we call birthmarks today. And back then they used to document these in, in their writings uh, as far as their marks. And I believe that in the Bible it's called the, the mark of Cain. So, you know, all these various famous people are documented in history when their stories are written about they, you know, we don't have pictures of all of them or, you know, direct descriptions of how they look to a T. But the common thread that I have read in reading these writings, even in the Bible, as I'd mentioned, the Mark of Cain is this mark, this birthmark. Pythagoras had a birthmark. Judas had a birthmark. Uh, Augustus Caesar had several birthmarks. Sir Lancelot, you know, in the mis the mythical part of it had a birthmark. King Arthur had a birthmark. Muhammad had a birthmark. Uh, the Merovingian kings were said to have a, a birthmark. Um, you taught you read Pluto or not Pluto, Plato, excuse me, and Plutarch. I kind of mixed the, the names right there. They talk about men of the aristocracy having certain birthmarks and people weren't allowed in their brotherhood unless they have that certain mark. So I believe back then they had used this mark to identify their kin or their ancestors, their cousins, et cetera, and they didn't have DNA or other ways to identify certain people. And as we had mentioned earlier, it was religions were ancestral. So I believe some of the first brotherhoods were kind of based on that, on um, relations of people that were related to them. So I, I believe that we are reincarnated. That's part of, you know, waking up to who you are. I haven't, you know, there's people that I've talked to on my podcast and, you know, are experts in reincarnation. They've written books on it. Talked to a Navy SEAL. Uh, he was the, actually a chief of the the Navy 24 years, probably one of the highest um, decorated Navy people that I, I could think of. Um, he wrote The Awakening of a Warrior and then Navy or Past Lives Remembered. And he documents all the different lives he has lived. And if you look at most of all those lives, they're all warriors and or warrior kings. And here he is in this life. You know, the SEALs are some of the most highly trained, hardest training you're, you're ever going to get. You know, only a certain percentage of people will ever pass it. Most people fail. And you have to be a badass warrior to do that. So I believe that these SEALs are actually following their gnosis of being warriors, of being Spartan warriors, of being Roman gladiators or whatever you might have you. And they're just kind of continuing that. And that's why they excel at warfare and at testing their bodies and, and so forth. So I believe when you, you kind of awaken to who you are, you could maybe study these past lives. And I know there's experts out there that will do what they call past life regression and, and stuff like that. I've never done it myself. So I don't know for sure who I was in a past life one of my connections that I'm connected to would be uh, Saint Bede, who I'd mentioned earlier. I don't know for sure, but I, I, I have seen myself in dreams, being in those locations, etc. And then I also have a, a, a white birthmark on my thigh, which Pythagoras was said to have a white birthmark on his thigh. Um, Apollo, all these you know different gods and so forth. So, in my studies in my ancestry of DNA. My DNA is in every place that these people have been in, uh, Pythagoras and, and Plato and, and Plutarch, et cetera. So I believe that there's a connection there with birthmarks, which I can call race marks, and then also past lives, et cetera. So that's kind of uh, my belief in a nutshell. I just don't – I can't prove it without a shadow of a doubt with, with science, but there is science there. And there was a – a Dr. Ian Stevenson, Stevenson, who in 1997 had written a book on reincarnation, and he had found that 35% of the people that he had studied that claimed to have past life recall um, claims of reincarnation had special birthmarks or 
marks where these wounds when they died from a past life were. So he would actually, you know, talk to someone who was shot or was stabbed who claims this in this life. He didn't, you know, bring these stories to their attention. They were the ones that had said that. And then when he would study the past lives that they claimed who they were, he would find literally this person was stabbed in the chest and this person saying he was this person had a birthmark or a mark in that exact same spot where that person was killed. Wow. And uh, you mentioned dreams. I'm sure you advocate listen to your dreams, see your dreams, because that goes right to the source. That's a a, a font of answers. Yes, I, I believe that when we dream, we're being told things sometimes. And whether that's, you know, you're, you're going down the wrong path or you're going down the right path, I believe that you could have visions as well and you could be sent to visions um, from the netherworld. And, and our ancestors had believed in this and dreams and visions were taken very seriously. And Carl Jung talks about it in his books. I forget exactly what book it was or books, but he talks in detail about him doing that himself and studying his dreams and trying to dissect them and trying to find the the meaning of these dreams. And often the dream that we're having, whether the vision or what we're seeing is not what is trying to be conveyed to us in, in the message. And that's what Carl Jung had taught me. And what I had learned is to start listening and, and trying to dissect my dreams. And I, I found out when I started doing that, and looking at, at it from you know the outside in was I was finding that these dreams were correlating with my life in, in a past life. And then I also have had meditation where I'm meditating and I'm given a certain vision or a certain word. And I would then literally go on my computer, Google it, and I would find some type of connection to, as I had mentioned, my ancestors, DNA, et cetera, with that specific symbol or or that vision or that teaching and it would literally catapult me in you know way ahead on my path over various stepping stones in my learning and and so forth so i i learned to listen to my dreams and try to dissect them to understand you know what is trying to be conveyed to me and then also any visions i have um, through meditation etc and they've all proven to be um, things that were conveyed to me somehow. And I don't know where they come from. I don't know if it's some type of DNA thing, as I'd mentioned earlier with the DNA gnosis that are, you know, our DNA or blood is like a computer program. And sometimes maybe these visions and everything might be coming from our blood um, somehow and, and this impression and it's, it's somehow being brought to our attention. So that's kind of my um, my theory there with, with reincarnation and blood and then, of course, DNA gnosis. Also, uh, and of course, I have dealt with this topic, uh, again, for years and with so many different guests and there are so many really intriguing uh, theories. But uh, it, uh, again, like DNA, your research is very unique. It's taking you to some, uh, some very interesting places. Tell us uh, in your research... Tell us about the origins of the Gnostics. Well, my research into the Gnostics, you know, we, we don't have many of their, their writings, as you know, Miguel. A lot of them were destroyed uh, by the church in various empires over time. Maybe some were lost. Uh, we, we have what the, the church fathers had written back then, Irenaeus and other church fathers, and they were always battling someone. And we, when we look who they were battling, it was normally someone in the Greco-Egyptian empire area. And I believe at that time, the Gnostics were centered in that area. And where I've been come to, where my Gnosis has led me, where I believe my intuition, intuition has led me, is to the, the island of Crete. And Crete, I had found, I'm really drawn to intuitively. Okay, so I, I want to backtrack a little bit. I, I'd said about visions and so forth. I had a vision about eight years ago and actually almost like a, a communication that said, you, we started the brotherhood. It was literally like we started the brotherhood. I, I, I don't know if it was God or, or something, but I was driving and I just didn't know where it came from. We started the brotherhood. And, and at the time, I didn't even study Gnosticism. I didn't even know what a Gnostic was. And that led me 
of course, that was right about after I had talked about Alex Jones and then me researching my last name and then getting this communication, we started the brotherhood. And when I, I think, I go, what do you mean the brotherhood? You know, and when I look at brotherhood today, you, you have the various night orders, you have the Catholic Church, the, the various religions, and then you have Freemasonry, you have Rosicrucians. I, I almost look at that as a, a brotherhood of various sects that are somewhat working towards the same end goal. And at the time of the founding of the church, that was the time when Rome was battling a lot with with Greece and Egypt. They eventually, of course, destroyed, not destroyed, but they had taken over that empire and that became the Roman Empire. And at that time, of course, they weren't too happy about being subject to Caesar. So I found eventually these teachings, some of these teachings, I believe, come from the island of Crete, in specific, the island, or the city of Knossos. Knossos actually is where we get Gnosis from. It's just spelled with a K. And they were known as the Knossians and, and the Cretans. And this very spot on Crete is where all archaeologists and historians say that Western civilization pretty much started would, would, you know, Europe, et cetera, was from Crete. And when I studied, you know, Rome and the early emperors, the first, I believe, 300 years, all the emperors were, their ancestors were from Crete. And then I started studying more into Crete, and there was a, a city named Caesarea. Augustus Caesar was there, um, Constantine. 300, you know, years later, he has a a villa there, you know, a vacation home. And this island was very important for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It was fought over, highly contested, and they had, it was known as the island of a hundred cities. So they had a loose confederation of various cities that worked with one another, but the capital was in Knossos. And this is where they found the linear A and B tablets, that have, you know, Phoenician kind of Egyptian style writing that they say was the the beginning of Greek writing. Uh, they had a, a relationship with Greece, you know, Solon, um, Plato, Plutarch, they all talk about this relationship. There was a, a man, I believe, in the 7th century BC, Eponidas, and his name was actually Eponidas Gnosis. And he was the one that restored Athens and he had made some certain laws. And this was the time of Solon. If you look at the dates, Eponidas lived at the same time as Solon. And he had created these various laws that and said to be a savior to the Athenians. So much so that when he had died, he was a Cretan again from Knossos. They had venerated his skin. And his skin was covered with tattoos. And so here are the Athenians and they honored and they worked directly with the, the Cretans. And I believe that's where we get all Cretans are liars to criticize. That is where our language comes from. And if we look at the word gnosis, that's actually what forms noble. Um, you know, we don't we spell it now N-O-B-L-E. But back then they spelled it G-N-O-B-L-E, you know, or a derivative of there. They're to know the king is to know and to be able and to be in power to carry out something. And I believe that was the time that the church decided just to do war with all wisdom, with all tribes. If you're not with us, you're against us. The ends justifies the means. And I believe we're still in that era, the year 2017, in which Augustus Caesar had started and he had conquered the Greco-Egyptian empire and he had changed the calendar. He had added july for his father julius caesar and then he had it he added august for himself augustus and here we are in that same age in the year 2017 so and i i believe we're starting to see the the end of that you know with you know the pope inviting the greek orthodox church for the first time in i think decades to to rome about two years ago he's meeting with the greek or excuse me the russian orthodox we're seeing this big ecumenical movement happening, and I believe that's where we're going to get eventually, you know, maybe a, a one world religion that's been 2,000 years in the making.
Yeah, even recently, I think the church call, called for a central bank. I'm like, what is a Catholic church calling for a central bank? <laughs> Very curious. Like you said, something's in the air and something's coming down the pipe, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see. And uh, Mo, you do talk and you talk a lot about in your book and your your articles about Freemasonry. And of course, you've had some high visibility Freemasons on your show, many of them. What are your views on the Freemasons and how it ties into all of this? The Freemasons play a, a unique part, I believe, in the, the grand scheme of things. I actually believe, you know, secret societies such as the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians and, and various orders are actually the, the Gnostic orders. That was where the secret knowledge was de deposited. You know, so I believe actually the Freemasons have worked hand in hand off and on with the Catholic Church for thousands of years. And I, you know, I study the history of Masons and, and who built all these great cathedrals and who built all these great stone monuments and who employed these people to do such things, you know, for the church. And, and you look and it was the popes and, and the bishops and they were in charge of the Freemasons who were building these cathedrals and these monuments for them. So naturally they would have some type of relationship going on. And I believe over time, you know, if you're building this specific church and the Masons are there and you've got the bishops, et cetera, working, you know, hand in hand. And sometimes, you know, I'm sure it took years to build some of these structures that they would have to develop some type of system to work with one another. So that the Freemasons were the first free men who were given the freedom to travel over county lines, over state lines by the church, who the Pope in these territories and the bishops were essentially the lawmen. And they would give these freemen, these Freemasons, a certain badge where they could travel, et cetera, to, of course, build these buildings. And I believe over time it, it developed, of course, at first as operative Freemasonry. And these Freemasons, I'm sure, had learned some secrets uh, of the the church or maybe what they were doing and they had to be bound by by a certain oath and i believe that over time eventually it developed into speculative freemasonry and more of a depository for all the secret teachings of the various sects that had joined in with the roman empire and with the catholic church to deposit their their wisdom their tribal wisdom um you know, whoever that might be, whoever they decided to honor into Freemasonry. And so we see Freemasonry kind of going hand in hand with the Catholic Church. And then I believe the propaganda is that they've always been enemies. But I believe that sometimes they have. But for the most part, they've been working hand in hand for, you know, 2000 years plus. And I, I believe that the Freemasons, of course, were doing that back in Greece, you know, working and building these monuments for their their archons there and they had their certain schools and their certain teachings etc and then that eventually became more of a philosophical thing where the teachings would be kept and you see all these philosophers and you know you look at uh, Albert Pike and Alephius Levi they had said the G in Freemasonry that you see in most of the lodges etc and it's usually framed with the the compass actually means gnosis and Manly P. Hollis had said that the, the Gnostic symbols of a thousand ages have been um, basically incorporated into the, the Freemason teachings. And they often talk about Freemasonry, Albert Pike, Manly P. Hall saying that it's actually a, a religion. So I believe that it's worked hand in hand together. I believe some of the most powerful people that are really in the know are powerful Freemasons from royal families where the, the lower people in the school, if they haven't done their, their studies, they're not going to know this history. But I, I've traced them all over the world. They're still very active, very powerful. They're in Washington. They helped build Washington, D.C. The founders of the country here in the United States were all Freemasons, bro Washington, bro Jefferson, you know. So um, right. they were definitely in. And then you see the Catholic Church, you know. Also in the inception of the United States and being involved in setting up all the universities and, you know, Maryland, that was named by the Catholics and Virginia, another name that we could say is for for Mary. And so I, I believe they work hand in hand and it's been an ecumenical movement for for many centuries. 
And why don't we talk about, uh, and of course this is in your book, and for the listeners there's a lot more about what Mo has been talking about in his book, The Order of the Gnostics, so check it out. But tell us a little bit about a mutual favorite god of ours, Abraxas, which I'd love to hear other people's views. Tell us what you found about this uh, terrible god above god. Well, I believe Abraxas eventually developed into who we might call the, the devil in the church. And so the, the, the teachings of Abraxas, I believe, to be similar to that of Yaldabaoth or, or however you might want to pronounce it. Um, so you, you have various early church fathers, you know, such as Irenaeus um, and others say that basically he was the God, the greatest God, the highest God, the almighty God, the Lord, the creator. And so you see this and then you see the symbology of Abraxas and he's always, you know, a serpent legs, a, a cock head. He's carrying, you know, um, a shield and so forth, but you always see this serpent like thing. And I, I believe that the serpent or in my studies, it, I, I know it for a fact, actually used to read worm. So when we, we read serpent, my understanding is that the Latin writers looking to corrupt these teachings to carry out their mission of world domination, of course, would be to corrupt some of these teachings. So the profane might see, and again, the word profane simply means uninitiated, and the profane would see a serpent and they would just think serpent, but they wouldn't think about worm and, and possibly how we were created. So I believe that the Abraxas is actually the creator of the world. So that would go along the lines of the teachings of the church fathers, calling him the God, the almighty God. But I believe he is the God of this earth. And if you look at humans, how we're created, we're essentially it, under the microscope, it, it's just like a little worm, you know, with the sperm. And I believe all this is is connected. Hermes, Hermes is just another word for wormies or worm. And Jesus in the Bible, he says, I'm a worm. You know, I'm trampled upon. I'm, I'm scorned upon. Job talks about being a worm, etc. So I believe these teachings were, again, their way to identify the creator of who we come from, where we come from, and where we descend from. And I believe not essentially, you know, the, the, the earthworm, but we descend from a certain type of worm, parasite that came, you know, maybe out of the ocean and, and brought us to who we were and who we are today. And we all descend from this, this, this one creator who was our original ancestor of all of us. And we're all, you know, different offshoots of that same tree, you know, different branches or whatever, but that Abraxas is our creator and he's also known as the destroyer. So if we look at as we we get older and we die, we actually get eaten up um, by these very worms and parasites that are infesting our body. You know, they say that the DNA of the human and the body, if you want to measure it, it's only as big as our toe. Wow. Okay, so, yeah, so... 99% of our DNA is consisting of other organisms in our body, Miguel, and, and listeners. So this, this makes you, you wonder. So uh, in my studies, I found the average person living today has eight different parasite organisms that are inside their body, and we're all coexisting. And then on top of that, we have billions of bacteria and, and fungi, and we're all kind of coexisting with one another. And I believe out of all of these different organisms, there's one in there. I, I, I have a feeling of what organism this is, but I haven't, again, tied it all the way to science that is actually who we come from. And I believe that there's a battle that happens between these organisms and, and so forth. And our job is to, of course, coexist with them and then live the best we can to keep this, this, this system in balance, these organisms from going off of balance, because that's when they go off balance, when we don't live right, you know, when we don't control our temperaments and our bodies heat up, it creates gases, it, it creates our very alchemical energies to become off balance. And that also happens to make our organisms and our bodies become unbalanced. And that's why people will get various diseases and they'll die sooner etc. And when you look at how people die, 
were actually pretty much eaten up from the insides out by these different organisms. That's how we decompose. And then our very essence goes into the soil. And I've studied this pretty, pretty thoroughly. And I was like, what, what is our essence? What is left of us when we die? If we do reincarnate back into this world, what is this essence? And I found the only thing left of us, the only alchemical energy left of us is a worm in its belly containing phosphorus that then goes into the soil and then it recycles back into nature and then who we are is is built upon this 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 phosphorus and phosphorus in latin means lucifer so you start seeing these these different connections between these teachings and i believe that's of course horus you know horus is the son of god he's the son of osiris in egypt in in greece you have zeus and the son of Zeus is Prometheus, and that's where we get the story of Lucifer, and he stole the, the fire from the gods, and he wanted to teach mankind the wisdom of the gods, and they just right. struck him down. And so you see these, these common teachings and so forth, and you know I believe that the phosphorus is the philosopher's stone, and if you study phosphorus, that's actually what makes our DNA fire. And I believe has a lot to do with, with our life and how we become enlightened etc. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Truly fascinating. And uh, yeah, down the rabbit hole, we will continue. <laughs> and uh, this topic is uh, very personal to you. But uh, as I read your work on this topic, I feel it's something very important to bring up. Uh, would you tell the listener, Mo, about the, the threat that is something that we sort of take for granted or ignore in this world, and that is mold? Yeah, so mold is something that I had found out about just recently. My, my son, as you know, Miguel, about two year, or a year and a half ago, uh, he had gotten sick in a house that we were renting and leasing in, in Carlsbad, California. It's a little nice beachside town in San Diego, California. And we lived there for five years, beautiful house, ocean view. I was doing great. My, my business at the time was doing awesome, surfing, working out. And then after we had moved in, we all started getting sick at different times, but more often than ever. And it just kept happening and happening, but we didn't correlate it with being the house that we were living in. I was thinking, you know, my son was getting sick a lot and it was probably from school and, you know, it just kept happening and happening. And then finally it culminated to the point five years after being in the house, one day he, he yells to me and he goes, dad, I can't walk, dad, I can't walk. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't walk? And he goes, I can't walk, Dad. I just can't. And he just he couldn't walk. And I didn't know what was going on. And then that slowly went away. And then one day we were walking down a trail and he literally falls on the ground in pain, you know, screaming. And I thought like he got bit by a, a snake or something because we were walking on a, a nature trail. And he goes, Dad, it's the same thing. I, I just fell I, this pain. And I literally had to call uh, carry him like three miles because he couldn't walk. And anyways, um, we, we ended up going to the doctors, several doctors trying to find out what was wrong with him. And they were claiming it was a sports injury, but I was like, how's he woke up and this happened. He, he was literally walking two miles an hour and he fell, you know, he didn't twist it, nothing. And this pain actually didn't go away this, this last time. Um, and he couldn't walk for several months and we took him to the orthopedics. Anyways, no one could figure out what was going on. So my search to know what was going on with my son led me to the internet. And then I started reading people that had similar symptoms and side effects that have been exposed to toxic mold. And then I remember seeing toxic mold in my, or mold in my house, like mildew and little spots. And we had several water leaks that were stopped, but never taken care of. And I would read about this and talking about water damage. And then I eventually decided to get a, a mold test. And I found out that our house had severely high levels of mold. The, the owner of the company goes, Mo, if you were my friend, and, and I even you know you're not my friend, I tell you, move out right away. It's the, one of the worst houses I've seen in the history of running my, my business for 30 years. So that kind of led me down the path of, of studying toxic mold and understanding that there's a lot of hidden mold issues and illnesses that are caused by mold. Mold can cause cancer. Uh, aflatoxins from the mold aspergillus that's found in common food. 25% of our food has mold in it that the FDA allows. And these carcinogens 
these mold aflatoxins cause cancer and cause other ailments. And I see the same ailments in a lot of people that are suffering today, but they don't know why they're suffering. And then in studying my ancestors, as I had mentioned earlier, and you know, uh, DNA is, is pretty important to me. And I have traced my DNA to the, the biblical Levites. And one of the Levites, of course, is Moses and Aaron. They're some of the most famous who are said to have started that tribe. And guess what? They were mold inspectors. Moses was a mold inspector. Aaron, wow. the, the pre yeah, so they were in charge of, of finding mold in their, their communities and their tribes. And it talks about it. I don't know it verbatim off the top of my head, but it talks about it in the Bible of them, you know, having to find mold. And if they find mold, they're supposed to, you know, basically vacate the, the premises. And if they come back seven days later and it's grown bigger, they got to tear down that building, all those stones, and they got to take it outside of the, the, the city and bury it, bury the rocks covered with mold. And what I learned in that studying is that many of the plagues in, in ancient times were actually caused by mold and by fungus. And do you know, do you ever see the Pope or the, in, in Catholic church, you have the priest and he has that little uh, stick with a ball and he does the holy water and he's kind of spraying it on people? Oh yeah, of course. That's called the aspergy. The aspergy comes from aspergillus and that symbol of the Pope and the Bishop when they're doing that is actually under a microscope looks exactly like an aspergillus spore to the T. Wow. Wow. So, Again, and, our ancestors knew a lot more than we give them credit, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, we can get into it further then, but that's kind of what led me to, to mold. And, and if you people out there, if I could leave you with something, if you're you know, we spend literally 19 hours a day in our houses, some people less, you know, we're in buildings and offices. If you're suffering or your children from various illnesses, asthma, the Mayo Clinic says that literally all sinus infections and asthma is, is, is caused by mold and you don't know why you're sick. It's, it's most likely mold in your home that is making you sick. So definitely get it tested if you're sick and you don't know why or if you see it and you smell it. You have it, and it could be very dangerous, and it could be very deadly. Wise words, listeners. So, uh, yeah, take heed, because uh, you never know how they're going to get you. And to end, Mo, tell us uh, for the listener, and of course I'll have this on the show notes, but tell the listeners where they can find out about your work and uh, what's going on at your site that they might be interested in. Sure. My, my website is called GnosticWarrior.com. And that's where I have all the, the different articles that I've written. I host other people's articles on there. I have some of Miguel's that he had written uh, for me a couple of years ago, uh, various podcasts. And, and that's kind of the, the central online place for the Order of the Gnostics. I'm building an online library of various podcasts and then also videos and articles. And my goal is to teach modern Gnosticism to people that are interested in not just knowing about the teachings of the ancient Gnostics or their history, but would like to become a Gnostic themselves and possibly learn about their ancestors, learn how to study their last name and, and what they could do to maybe, you know, walk their path and follow their heart. So listeners go to, you know, GnosticWarrior.com. I hope to work actually with Miguel here in the, the near future. We're going to hopefully collaborate on various articles, videos, and podcasts where we actually take some of these things that I'm talking about and then also that Miguel is talking about and then we do specific one hour, two hour podcasts and videos teaching you about these teachings that will hopefully carry you on on your path. Indeed, and it should be a very dangerous, fun time, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it will. Who knows what will happen, but hopefully we can uh, set fire to the world and uh, get some get some worms and phosphorus up from the ground uh, and see what happens. Hallelujah. But, <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah, brother. But I think that's all the time we have today, Mo. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on Aeon Bite and discussing your book, The Order of the Gnostics ancient teachings for the modern gnostic as well as your other ventures which are uh opening the eyes of humanity when it most needs it you're welcome miguel it's been an honor to be on the show and thank you take care bro 